Look at your neighbor and say hello. Welcome to Monday nights. Turn to somebody else and say, so glad to see you. All right, speed round. I want you to give five high fives right now. Five high fives to five different people. Go for it. Boom, boom, boom. Let's go. Five it up. Five it up. All right, guys, well, welcome to Monday nights. Are you ready to worship tonight? You can go ahead, come to the front, claim a seat, come to the front. We're going to worship tonight. We're so excited to be together. Alvin, I heard word in the street you're singing a new song. Who's excited to hear a new song from Alvin tonight? We got Ian Ross in the building bringing a word tonight. Where's all the messenger track from Circuit Rider Experience? Who loves Ian Ross? Yeah, me too, me too. All right, crew. I'm going to pray here. If I get everyone's attention really quick, we're going to go in together tonight. I just want you to begin to posture your heart towards Jesus. Close your eyes, lift your hands, whatever you want to do. But we're going to go after his presence tonight. I already know what Ian's preaching on, and I just am like so excited. I got to hear one of Alvin's new songs at Black Voices, so I'm just, everything tonight's layered and so much fun. So Holy Spirit, we come before you right now. We just give you glory right now, Jesus. Just, just in your own words, I just want you to begin to tell Jesus how much you love him how much you honor him, how much he's done for you. Just begin to worship him with your own mouth, your own words right now, out loud, out loud. Don't whisper it, honor him. Say it out loud, Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, thank you so much for all that you've been doing. We give you praise for this week. We give you praise for this DTS, God, for the staff, for Carry to Love, Brave Love, music, media, God people in college and high school, Lord, the workplace, so much is going on. So Holy Spirit, we just ask that your manifest presence would come. I just want you to pray in your own words right now. Just say, Holy Spirit, come. Just say, just invite the Holy Spirit to encounter you tonight. Just in your own words, just say, Holy Spirit, I want you to encounter me. I just take off every barrier, every wall. Just come into this place. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you right now. We welcome you in this place right now. Holy Spirit, come. We just ask your presence. We wait on you. We just ask your presence will begin to come right now in the name of Jesus. Lastly, Lord, we're going to worship. But Lord, I pray your love would land on us today as we worship Jesus. God, I ask that as we lift our love to you, God, that your love would come pouring down over every single person in this room, in Jesus' name.
more time. How great is our God, and how great is our God, yeah. Sing age to age, he stands. Yeah. Open age to age, he stands. And time is in his hands. The beginning and the end. The beginning and the end. He's the God. He's the God.
tonight and you say, I want to burn for Jesus more, can you just raise your hands? If you've come here tonight and you go, man, I want the fire. I've come for a baptism of fire. If that's you, just raise your hands. I just want us to cry out in this moment for God to baptize us with fire tonight. If that's your cry, God, baptize my heart with fire. Just for a few moments, just lift your voice to heaven tonight. Let them hear your song tonight. Yeah, that's it. Come on, lift your voice to heaven. Oh, I want to burn.
continue to lift up your own song to heaven. Come on, let's just stay in this place of adoration. Let's just stay in this place of praise. Let's stay in this place of thanksgiving. Yes, Lord. God. 
Lift it up.
going to sing a new song today. And it's all about surrender unto Jesus. And in this, I, I sing a line that says, there's so much joy in my surrender because I've seen that your way is better. And, you know, a lot of you guys may not know my story. You may not know where I come from or anything like that. But I think we've all been through a time where we thought our way was better. We've all been through a time where we thought that we could figure it out on our own. That, you know, we just had to, you just got to work, you got to grind for it. You know what I'm saying? And it doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't always pan out the way that you wanted it to. But in Jesus, whenever you lose your life, you find it in him. And whenever you trade your depression, you get joy. Whenever you trade the suicidal thoughts that you've been battling with, you find yourself wanting to live more than you've ever had before. Whenever you trade the anger that you've been holding onto and harboring, you find yourself walking in forgiveness to everybody. And that all starts at surrender. That all starts at letting go. And so tonight we're just gonna sing. It simply says, for Jesus, I live and die. For Jesus, I give my life to see the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here at Part of Circuit Riders. It's because we want to see the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. So we're gonna sing this song tonight and we're just gonna let the Lord do what he do. So let's do it. Receive the reward. Receive the 
I've seen your ways better There's so much joy in my surrender yeah. No more excuses left For you who paid my debt I'm giving everything To live for you, my King There's no excuses left For you who paid my debt I'm giving everything to live for you, my King There's no excuses left For you who paid my debt I'm giving everything To live for you, my King There's no excuses left For you who paid my debt I'm giving everything To live for you, to live for you There's no excuses Given much, they love much. Lord, I love you because you first loved me. Because you first loved me. Yes, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for fighting for.
Jesus, we're just so thankful in this place. We just thank you every time we worship you come, Jesus. We know you're always with us, but it's just that manifest presence, that faith that you're near that comes when we worship you, Jesus. God, we thank you that you're near to every single person in this place tonight. We pray that faith would arise in every single person here tonight. Faith that you love them. Faith that you're for them. Faith that they're standing in victory, God. Faith that the future is going to work out, God. Faith that you're going to move through them in powerful ways. Faith that their calling is more than they know, God. Faith that you're going to use them in their city and in their campus and their work. Holy Spirit, we pray tonight, open our eyes to what you're doing through us. We just worship you, Jesus. We just thank you. My dad always teaches this. He says, you always want to linger in the anointing. You feel that in this place. You want to linger when the Holy Spirit comes close. Don't be quick to leave the presence. Because in the presence, that breakthrough comes. I only want every head bowed for a moment. There are so many breakthroughs that so many of us need. My dad's in a hospital tonight still needing breakthrough. I don't know what the breakthrough you need. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your school. Maybe it's friendships. Maybe it's a personal issue. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's a difficult scenario. Whatever it is right now, with faith, not a maybe, not a hope so, with faith, I want you to ask your Father who gives good gifts for that breakthrough right now, out loud, just on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Just begin. Say, Jesus, I'm bringing before you my needs. I need this breakthrough. Just begin to pray. Jesus, we just say you are the miracle worker. Jesus, we say that it's not too hard for you. God, we ask that in every situation, every prayer, pray tonight. Holy Spirit, we pray you would release breakthrough in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask for every person, every scenario, Lord, that you would move and do what you can do that we cannot do. We just thank you for your love tonight. So God, as we move into the word tonight, as we open your scriptures, Lord, we just pray that we go to another level. We just pray that you would speak right to us, right to this situation that we're in right now. We're going to end, but I'm going to challenge you with this before I let you go say hi to people. You know, part of circuit rider culture is that we don't just preach messages to know them because it's important to know them. We come and remind ourselves of what it means to live for Jesus so we can go live it. But there's a third thing that we value at Circuit Riders is that we would get the message so deeply in our heart that we would become messengers for this message. These nights should be like a training boot camp for you. You should be going and ripping off these talks. This is your next Bible study. This is a roommate needs to hear this. This is a family member you need to call. So tonight, I feel especially tonight, what we're going to be talking about is a word not just for our community, not just a word for us to live, but it's a word for us to repeat. So when you listen tonight, I want you to lean in a little extra because I want you to act like next week I'm going to make you preach the same thing. I want you to act like, man, I'm going to have to say this to somebody because it's a message for our whole generation. Jesus, we love you so much. And all God's people said, amen Amen and amen. All right, go ahead. Say hello to somebody. Find a seat. Go ahead, find your seat, find your seat. We're so happy you're here tonight. 
If you have an open seat next to you, can you just wave your hand really quick? We got a traffic jam of people in the back. If you got an open seat next to you, just wave your hand. Go ahead, just take a seat somewhere. Go ahead, find an open seat. Circuit Rider staff, if you could come and find a seat, go ahead and sit down. Everybody in the back, everybody look to the back and say, what's up? One more time, what's up? Come find a seat, all the circuit riders in the back. All the circuit riders in the back, come find your seat. Are these front row open? I need a faith-filled front row with some amens in their heart tonight. I need some amens in the front row. I need some fresh faith up here. There we go. Guys, we're packed out tonight. We got people sitting everywhere. If you got an open seat next to you, can you wave your hand one more time? I need a faith-filled person right here. Right over here. All right, can you look at your neighbor and say, we got some announcements. Who wants to hear some announcements tonight? All right, I got a number of announcements. Let me get everyone's attention real quick. Let's quiet down. We're going to rock and roll. So we got a couple announcements tonight, actually three of them. Number one. How many of you have been to a greenhouse set yet? Give me a wave of hands. Okay. Who has not been to a greenhouse set yet? Greenhouse worship and prayer set. It's okay. Raise your hand. I'm seeing some circuit riders. I'm judging you. No, I'm just kidding. No, we've all been. We've all been. We're good. We're good. Okay. Everyone say Tuesday. Tuesday. Wednesday. Wednesday. Thursday. Thursday. Eight to ten. All right, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 8 to 10, we have our greenhouse worship set. The first hour at 8 is devotional. Yeah, a.m. in the morning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe we should make it at night because we're all late night people. No, I'm just kidding. All right, morning, 8 a.m. to 10. Some of you are like, I don't even get up before 11. That's some next week's message. We'll be rebuking you. Make sure to come back. I'm just kidding. I'm totally joking. It's a joke. Relax. Some of you got all nervous and tense. All right, I got two more announcements. Next one, how many of you have ever taken part in Carry the Love? How many of you have never heard of Carry the Love? Raise your hand. What is Carry the Love? All right, Carry the Love is our annual college tour where we go, we unite campuses, we unite communities and cities around evangelism. We unite young people who have a passion to see their community transformed by the gospel. So how many of you are university students in SoCal? Give me a wave. How many of you are high school students in SoCal? Give me a wave. All right. Well, here's the deal. The deadline to host Carry the Love is almost here. So if you want to host something, carrythelove.com. Everyone say carrythelove.com. All right. Sign up. It's really easy to work with you. It's amazing. Number two, where are the ladies at? We also this year for the first time, not really the second time, but the first time in a major way, we have a Brave Love Women Tour taking place. Man, how many of the men feel jealous now? You want like a man tour. Man tour. <laughs> All right, well, Brave Love Women is going on tour in an amazing way. They're going to be going into every region of America, but SoCal, if you are, hold on, if you are, let them hear me, if, if you are a woman and you are passionate about gathering other women to activate your voice, Right, because we know women can preach. Activate, right? 
They can be evangelists, activate them to reach their cities, activate them in compassion and missional projects. You got to go to bravelovewomen.com and sign up for tour. Well, just hold on. Carry to love, what happened? Look at this. Like, we need to just, I'm just going to say carry to love tour just for a redeeming, like that you're excited about it for the live stream. People are watching, guys. Come on. Who's excited for carry the love? All right. All right. Last, last one. Last one. Black Voices is also going on tour. So if you want to roll with this tour, I'm joining that tour. That's the fun tour. That's where it's all at. I mean, every time I go to a Black Voices gathering, it's like 20 church services per hour, per hour. It's like I literally have been like a Christian 20 years after just being a part of one weekend. That's how much I'm a chair. It's amazing. So blackvoicesmovement.com. Do I got it? All right, blackvoicesmovement.com. If you're on the live stream, we love you. Sign up. All right. Guys, tonight we are continuing in 1 John. How many of you have read 1 John before? And you're like, this is a pretty good book, you know. God is love. I like that part. How many of you realize that there were so many deep points in 1 John? I know, I don't know if I fully understood it before I got into it. How many of you are still recovering from Jonathan Stamper last week? Yeah, I just started yelling unclean, unclean at the end of the service. No, I'm totally joking. All right, but tonight, guys, we're continuing. We are letting, like, all our young preachers out of the bullpen. See, one of my, here's what I love about young preachers. They got no filter. I love no filter, right? It's so much fun, at least most of the time. Sometimes I'm like, oh, man, maybe filter that. But, uh, but for the most part, I love no filter and tons of passion. Because, and I love Ian, one of the things I love about Ian, he's going to come up here in a second, is Ian means everything he says. There is no other side of Ian. He's Ian if he's on a stage. He's Ian if you meet him at the house. He's Ian if you go to in and out with him. And then this guy, he's got so many crazy revival stories. I was out in and out with him last week, and he told me a deliverance story I will never forget. Are you telling it tonight? Not tonight. All right, next time, next time. So can we give a huge circuit rider welcome to Ian Ross tonight as he comes up? Hello, hello. What's up, everybody? How you guys doing? I like the energy. I'm stoked for tonight. Give me a second. Let me get this. Let me get this sorted. My goodness. <laughs> well, about that story. If you come to In and Out, maybe I'll tell it. I want In and Out tonight, so you can follow me there. But man, before I start, just want to say a, a huge thank you uh, to Brian, to Nick. I love you guys so much. So honored to serve here at Circuit Riders. And uh, excited to, to bring what, what Brian had, and Nick had decided tonight was the night we talk about. Uh, I'm not going to say it yet. It's a surprise. I was going to say it. Now I'm like, wait, wait, wait I don't want to do that yet. Here's what I want to do to start is I want you guys all to look at your neighbor and say, get ready. And now I want you to close your eyes. And you're going to say this to the Lord. Jesus, I'm ready for something new. In Jesus, name, In Jesus' name, I will leave this place, leave this place and, never and never be the same. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Hey, in the back, could you turn this up just a, a little bit? I like to be able to hear myself. I know I'm probably loud out there, but I like to be able to hear myself. Uh, it helps me keep track of my thoughts. Does that make any sense? Let's jump in. All right. 
So tonight we're continuing in the book of 1 John. So if you've, maybe you've read ahead, maybe you've kind of gotten the passage we'll talk about today. But the thing is, is that this whole sermon is going to be based out of just three verses. Like Nick said, the book of 1 John has so many important truths that are packed in just those five chapters. So we're going to go into just three verses, and I believe that if you guys lean in, that this could be a sermon that changes your life. So just lean in with me. Just lean in. Not everybody got to do it. Everybody got to lean in a little bit. There we go. Lean in. Stay focused. There's going to be a lot of Bible today, but I believe that's because the Bible is the only thing that doesn't lie ever uh, and is the full truth. So if you want good teaching, go to the Bible. So I'm going to quote a lot of the Bible, so if you want to lean into that, um, this kind of stuff is, is what will allow you to live an uncompromised lifestyle. This is what we're talking about the past couple of weeks is talking about what it looks like to be a Christian, right? And specifically, this book was not written in context. This book was not written to unbelievers. It's written to Christians, right? Nick's first message. Does anyone remember what it's on? Somebody shout it out. Only three people. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nick. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let's pretend that didn't happen. What was the message on? Ah, oh, there we go. Awesome. That, that, perfect. So it's on fake Christians, right? It was about partnering with darkness and continuing to walk in darkness. And, and what it really said there was that we can claim all that we want to have intimacy with God, but if we are constantly partnering with darkness, we lie. Okay, number two. Does anyone remember what Jonathan preached on last week? And it was? My goodness. Stamper, are you here? <laughs> it was how to ask for forgiveness, right? So the reality is, is that, I mean, this is gospel 101 from the very beginning. Sin separates us from God, right? So if sin separates us from God, the only way back to intimacy is through asking for forgiveness. So when you trace it through, what we've been talking about is simply not just talking to the Christian, but talking to the Christian explaining how to have intimacy with God. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the very specific thing that has potential to rob us from our relationship, from our intimacy with God, not just now in this life, but it has the potential to rob it from our eternal destiny. Oh. Today we're going to be talking about love not the world. Love not the world. Open your Bible if you have it. If you don't, Amazon Prime. It'll be here by my second point. Um, all right. <laughs> all right. First John chapter 2, verse 15 to start. Let's read through the whole thing, and then, and then we'll break it down. How does that sound? Awesome. You guys all there? We good? Does anyone need more time? No, okay, tough. All right, here we go. Verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jeez. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of the Lord will live forever. Abides forever. My goodness. I love the Bible because, it, it, like Nick said, eh, about young preachers, but it's the Bible too. It doesn't hold back. It says it how it is. And sometimes it stings a little bit, right? It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not like a partial thing. It's not like, well, you know, you're kind of on the edge. No, it's like if you love the world and the things in the world, phew, the love of the Father is nowhere to be found. Nothing at all. It's pretty crazy. So let's break it down. Let's jump right in. Verse 15. Because when it says, do not love the world or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now that might sound a little confusing, right? Anyone in here know John 3.16? Does anybody not know? No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to put you on the spot. That just means you weren't in Sunday school growing up. Um, I had to memorize that verse, I mean, a billion times. It was always the one. When, did anyone ever have, like, you had to present two verses or something like that for a competition? And you always had one in the back pocket. You only had to memorize one. It's a pretty good deal. All right, so you might say, well, didn't it say that God so loved the world that he sent his only son? It says, for God so loved the world. And then here the instruction is, do not love the world. 
or the things in the world. We say, all right, well, then, you know, it must be in the translation. Let's go back, check the Greek. Well, the word for world in Greek in this context is cosmos. But the problem is it's used in both places. So we're still right back at the same place. So for God so loved the cosmos, right, that he sent his son. And it says, do not love the cosmos. What does that mean? What is it saying? Well, it's, it's very important that you continue reading in the context of this verse. Because otherwise, you could get distracted. Okay, do not love the world. And this is how you can see some people who claim that they know God or claim that they read the Bible who then completely separate themselves from the world. And they lack compassion for the world, right? Because we're, we're told to match the compassion of that of Jesus. And so we have to love the people that are in the world. We have to. It's an instruction. You could read like three verses from the New Testament and you would see that. It's throughout the entire theme of the New Testament. So we have to keep reading and understand what is he talking about when he says the world. You guys with me? Does this make sense? So it's not just for God so loved the world. He's saying for God so loved the people in the world. Now let's look at what he's talking about in this passage. This is referring to in verse, chap in verse 16. Let's read it. For all that is in the world, perfect. It literally tells us, right? Do not love the world. And that says for all that is in the world. It says the desires of the flesh the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. So this is what it's talking about when it says, do not love the world. It's broken down into three categories, and we're going to break them down, each one of them right now. Does that sound good? Yeah. Are you guys ready for that? Yeah. There are three categories which all of sin, if you trace it back, can fall into these categories. The desires of the eyes, the desires of the flesh, or the pride of life. First, is the lust of the eyes. Well, first we have to define desire. You know, uh, desire in this context actually specifically meant, uh, translated to a lust for, like a need for. It even says an inordinate desire, which is an excessive desire. So it's not just a, a like, oh yeah, it's cool. No, it's I need. It's like a desire that rules over your life. I don't know if that's anyone, been anyone else in the room, but maybe at some point in your life, you can trace back to a point in your life where you saw something and you were like, I need that. Like, I really, really, and you were, didn't even understand afterwards why your heart was so caught up with that one thing. That's what it's talking about, is it's a desire, an excessive desire for something. So the first one, we're going to call it, because it's more accurate, we're going to call it the lust of the eyes and the lusts of the flesh, because it's more so than just a small desire. First, the lust of the eyes, defined as the things that look appealing to the eyes, desires for possessions or things, right? That one, I mean, that's, this one is one that maybe in my life, when I was, when I was looking up to, uh, I watched a lot of YouTube when I was younger, and so I would watch a lot of these people who had their brand new cars and their fancy cars and their clothes at like 19, and I was like, I want to do that. But in reality, I didn't want to do that for any reason other than I just wanted the nice car or I wanted the nice clothes. I had a lust for a Lamborghini. Was that anyone else in the room when they were little? No, just me? I just, I wanted that Lambo. I was like, I'm going to get that. What that was in, in that time, it was, a, it was a lust of my eyes. It was a consuming of one thing that I was like, I have to do it. I have to do it. I have to get it. I have to get it. Now, it can trace to a bunch of different things in our lives can break it down a couple examples it could be something like you see what someone's wearing this is we're just going to be kind of fun with a couple of these examples we see what someone is wearing they have nice shoes on or whatever that is and all of a sudden you're caught up with this desire like i need those shoes and then sometimes you're even like why did i think why did i think that way we're like i need those shoes nick give me your shoes give me your shoes you just get caught up with this desire, and it can go to a lot of material things. If you, and, and, and this goes from even the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah, thou shalt not covet. It's this desire and this longing that is unnatural for something in the world. It's not that the things are wrong. It's that your desire is twisted. Does that make sense? It's that the desire has taken a hold over your relationship with God. Number two is the lust of the flesh. That is things that are in your body or your flesh or your fleshly desire. There's the, the reality of your spirit man and your flesh. I know we're getting a little deep. Are you guys still tracking with me? We're going to go there because this will help you. This will help you. It helped me. When you realize that there's a reality of the, your, your, there's your flesh that is constantly trying to tempt you and make you fall into sin, and then there's your spirit man, which is able to resist, right? And so what we're talking about, the flesh, the lust of the flesh, is an attraction to things that your body craves or desires, 
So it, this is something um, perhaps like an alcohol addiction or even a drug addiction or an addiction to sex, right? Didn't want to go there, but we did. This is what we're talking about. Go there. See, y'all know me, right? Well, I'll say, hey, I don't know if I should go there. What do you say? Go there. Hey, see, there we go. All right. Man, I, I need you guys to shout back a little bit more. It keeps me going. All right. So what this is, though, in reality is, is that you, is the lust of the flesh is a temptation to cross a boundary of your flesh. So, for instance, have, if, if you've ever, and we'll talk about this later, but even if you maybe have crossed a boundary with a, a significant other that you thought you would never go there. Right? It's a temptation. You thought, I'd never go there. I'd never cross that line. And then presented with that temptation, it's the lust of the flesh that overcomes in that situation. Does that make sense? That's what this is. So first is what? The lust of the what? Pride. Second is the lust of the what? Flesh. And the third is the pride of life. And this one we're going to go ham on. Are you guys ready for this? We're going to really go into this one. This is the pride of life. And this is the one that as I started reading, it started exposing me a little bit. So we'll see if this starts exposing any of you here as well. All right. The pride of life is an arrogance or a pride about how we carry ourselves or about who we are. The word for pride directly translates, I know this is a weird word, I've never used this once in English, but it translates to braggadocious. It's just what it does. Um, <laughs> never used it. This is my first time. But this means to be, to basically, it just boils down, it means to be boastful or arrogant. So pride in a Christian's life is, is probably one of the number one things that will rob you from the presence of God, is pride. We're going to break down a couple reasons, and the reason why is because it can really sneak in there. And you may not even realize that you have pride in a certain area until I read some of these points. Are you all ready for this? This, this may have just been, been me, but let me know. I figured we'd go over a couple points of pride that we may not even know. Number one, thinking subconsciously even, subconsciously thinking that you are better or more important than someone else. Number one. Now, hey, who here was here Monday morning meeting? Anyone in the room here? Monday? Okay, didn't Matt literally talk about these things? I already had them in my notes. I was like, I don't know how he got access to my, to my Google Drive here. But um, it was literally what he was talking about today. But it's the reality that subconscious thinking, and you can catch yourself and you're like, wait, why am I even thinking that way? This is the reality of we have to kill our flesh because otherwise, even subconsciously, we're pridefully putting ourselves in a position of elevation over another person. So number one is subconsciously thinking that you are better or more important than someone else. Number two is a tough one. You sure you guys want to go here? Yeah. All right. A strong desire for position or promotion. It's a tough one in ministry. Because in ministry, it just seems like I, when I, I grew up in the church, it always seemed about what's the next promotion, right? Everywhere we go to serve, I think it's so funny um, that, like, if you go to serve at other places, they all have specific titles. Here we're just, like, the circuit riders, and we just kind of do our thing. I love going to, like, other places that have, like, a billion different titles. And they're like, hello, I am Count so and I don't know what they say, but they just have this crazy title. Because it's, it's almost this ladder or this step up of like, oh, I got to go to the next step of promotion. And so a strong desire for promotion or position, what it boils down to is it's the need to be seen by others. It's the need to be seen by others. Number three, Nick talked about this when he preached, and it was the one-up man. Do you remember one-up man? So when someone's telling a story, you always have to have the better story. And they're like, oh, so for instance, I, I, I messed up my ankle a little bit this week playing soccer. It was a sad day. But, you know, you'd be telling someone, man, I really messed up my, my ankle. And they're like, you would not believe what happened to me back in fourth grade. I fell off my skateboard. They had to helicopter medivac me out of there. You're just like, all right, dude, awesome. My ankle hurts. That's all I was trying to say. But do you see what we're saying, right? It's, it's funny. It's silly. But the reality is, is that if you catch yourself with a constant need to have the better story or to be a part of the conversation, it's also, again, boils down to the need to be seen or known by others or a, or a pride about yourself. Number four, number four is only doing something for, a, for personal gain. Only doing something if I get something out of it. So, for instance, uh, this is a temptation. I've talked to a lot of, of young preachers. In the very beginning, it's always the same. You go into, you, like, your first time you're ever preaching, you go in, and in the back of your mind, you don't even know why it's there, but in the back of your mind, you're like, I wonder if there's anyone in the room that's going to see me 
and it's like that, that's a minister or that's a pastor that's going to invite me to preach somewhere. I, that might just be me, but I've talked to a, a couple other of my friends too. And you always had in this back of your mind all the time is someone here that's going to see me that could help me out in the future. It's a subconscious thought. And then you sit down and you're like, wait, why am I thinking that right now? I just love people. That's why I'm here. But subconsciously, your mind is thinking, what if there's someone here who can help me? It's a selfish desire. It's selfish gain. For instance, hey, let's do a funny example. You're in youth group, and your pastor has asked you to pray over the pizza party. All right? And you're sitting there, and you're about to pray, and you're like, yes, this is my moment. She's going to see me pray. Or he's going to see me. You're just ready for it. Your crush is over there, just off to the left. All right, church, can we lift our hands now? And you're like, bro, it's a pizza party. He's like, dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, Jesus Christ, God, Lord, we come before you today, God, Lord. <laughs> right? So you're, you're praying, but your motive in which you're praying, what you're doing is it's really, you're in the whole time, you're not really praying to God. You're doing it for a selfish reason. You guys with me? Does this make sense? You guys still tracking? All right. So that's number four, is only doing something at a personal gain. Number five, number five, there's a lot of these. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. I told you, is anyone like feeling a little bit exposed yet? A little bit? All right, number five, number five, do things that you didn't have to do often at the cost of others to boost your self-image or what other people think of you. So it's the need to do something, accomplish something. Okay, funny example again. Should we do a funny example? All right, so I was, I was probably like 13, 14, and I had this, this wonderful idea that the best way to impress this girl at my church was to climb up to the second-story balcony of my church and jump off, right? <laughs> Anyone ever seen those cool parkour videos? There's nothing cooler than someone jumping off a second-story balcony, you know, and doing a little tuck and roll. So I got up to the edge. I stood over. They were all watching. Zero reason for me to do this, right? I stand, and then I just jumped down. I landed so flat-footed on the ground, and I was like, mm, mm. you see that? It's like, you see that? I, was in, I had to go to the doctor. I had like a bone bruise in my heels for that. I like limped into the bathroom so I could kind of hide, and then someone came in, you all right? Yeah, dude, I'm good. I'm all right. But what I was doing, I was trying to, I was trying to get selfish gain. I was really just trying to boost myself. I was trying to brag to this girl, be prideful about who I was. And in reality, it did something I, I did not have to do, right? For a, real, a more real example, since that was just a funny example. Um, but a, a more real example is, is literally any way, even at the cost of others, when you use, um, use other people for personal gain, okay? All right, number six, and this is the crazy one. So you sure you guys want me to go there? The feeling of the need to defend yourself from others' accusations. Ouch. The feeling or the need to defend yourself from others when they accuse you. If people attack you, if you often feel the need to defend yourself, what it really is is you're trying to defend your image could be because you take pride in who you are in your image. When Jesus, you say, say, hey, hold on. Well, what about Jesus? When he was mocked, he stayed silent the whole time. He did not speak back once to his accusers. You see, he had nothing to prove. You don't need to defend yourself if you have nothing to prove. I, I, I did TikTok for a long time. Got a lot of people that did not like me. We talked about healing. A lot of people don't think it's real, so people always comment on there and just tear you up, make videos about you. Uh, recently, I actually made it in life, had a 40-minute documentary made of me on YouTube, e exposing me. Um, for <laughs> Now, <laughs> sit down, sit down. Now, if I felt the sudden urge to defend myself from him, I would be trying to defend myself against, or defend my image against someone I have no need to. I have no need to defend myself against that person because I love him. If you're watching, I love you so much. Thank you for tuning in. I really do. I'm genuine. And the reality is, is that if you have something to prove to other people, then you have to defend yourself from accusations. I don't have time to waste on there. I've already been approved of by God. Amen. See, I have nothing to prove. If you, if you, 
what was I going to say? Sorry. Sorry, guys. There's no need to defend yourself if you have nothing to prove. Right? I serve one God, and it's not the God of this world. It's not the God or the things of this world. It's not even the people in this world. It boils down to I serve one God who's the king of kings, and his approval is the only one I need. And so if you're living for his approval, it won't matter who accuses you, who talks bad about you on your school campus. Believe me, I've been there. I wanted to leave school because of what happened. And yet I stayed to it. Why? Because not one thing that someone says behind your back, you can slander my name all you want. I've got all the approval I need in the King of Kings. He died for me and he lives and I live with him. That's the thing. The pride of life is wanting the world to embrace you. That's what it boils down to. Those were the six main things. But the pride of life is simply just wanting the world to love you. Just wanting it to embrace you. Well, maybe I can be a Christian, but still, you know, everyone still loves me out there. I thought about, I had this, I had this time in my life when I first got saved. I was like, I bet I can be that Christian that just all the celebrities still love. And they're just like, that one guy. I realized it's impossible. It's not possible. Because the world and God are, in com- are completely opposite. The world and God are complete. We'll get into that in a second, but they're completely opposite. And so you will never be, as a Christian, if you're truly living a life of no compromise, you will never be attractive to the world. You will never be attractive to the things of the world. Now, what, what can attract people is what's inside of you. But you as a person, the world is not going to like you. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. Why do you think if I was crucified and beaten, why do you think they're going to love you? Think of all the apostles. I mean, some of them died some crazy deaths, getting their heads cut off or hanging upside down or crazy things like that. Why do you think that our life's going to be any different? Why do we have this elevation in our minds that here we are in America and everyone's going to love me? The reality is, is that the pride of life is wanting everybody to embrace and to love you. We have no need to earn the love of other people. Or or, or the approval, I should say. We have no need to, to earn the approval of other people. So the question is, when faced with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life, which do you choose? Do you choose to desire after those things or seek after the heart of God alone? That's what it boils down to. A reason that many Christians, well, can I go here? The reason many Christians never or go a long time without feeling the manifest presence of God, they feel as though God never speaks to them, waiting for God to call them into something, and they're waiting, and then it goes a year, and then two, oh, well, just haven't heard from God yet. The reality is, meanwhile, many times we are submitted to lesser lovers. How many of you ever heard of a dry season? Now find that in the Bible, please. And then can, Here's the reality. Here's the reality. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice. So a good God who loves me, wants to speak to me, and wants to commune with me, and here I am saying, oh, well, you know, just going through one of these dry seasons, brother. How many of you know we all go there? I've been there in my life when I've tried to say that. And then I sat down and I said, wait a second, I haven't read my Bible in three weeks So I think I'm going to expose myself. I was back before my my Bible college days, and then in Bible college just started roasting everybody when they said dry season. I realized I couldn't say that to people's faces anymore. They're like, I'm in a dry season. No, you're not. You're in a sin season. I was like, like, okay, all right. All right, I can't go there. I was like, I can't go there. I got to stop. I got to stop. I want to read one verse, though. It's in Psalms. You guys all know it. Ready? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That doesn't sound like a dry season to me. That sounds pretty dang good. He restores my soul. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That sounds like a good God. What I want to say to you today is if you felt that way, examine your heart and say, God, I want to be submitted to you. No lesser lover, no other thing, no thing of the world. I want you to be my only desire, and I guarantee your life will flip around just like that. All right, should we keep going? All right, it sounds cool. How do we do it, right? 
How do we overcome? How do we get past the things of the world, the temptations of the world that come, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? Well, would you believe me if I said it's been here since the beginning of time? Go with me, Genesis chapter 3. We're going all the way back. Somebody say all the way back. All the way back. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Going to read just a couple verses. Track with me. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. You probably all know this story, right? Watch this. But the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. Now this is the part you need to catch. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she saw it was good for food, the lust of the flesh. She saw that it was a delight to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise. Not just like, I'm going to eat it and, and level up, <laughs> level up, now I'm more wise. No, I wanted to be like God. That's the pride of life. So from the beginning of time, why didn't it just say she ate it? It says she saw the tree was good for food, delight to the eyes, and desired to make one wise or to be like God. So from the beginning of time, it was the same thing. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But Jesus overcame it. You might say, amen, the cross. No, no, not the cross. Not the cross. Go quickly, quickly. Matthew chapter 4. We're in a race. Obviously, ultimately, everything was defeated at the cross. Amen. Clarification. All right. This is good, though. Y'all got to roll with me. Y'all rolling? All right. Matthew chapter 4, you guys there? Here we go. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Oop. My God. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Nice. That's a pretty good Bible verse right there. <laughs> After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I would think so. Revelation for tonight. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Does that ring a bell with anybody? He was hungry, so he was tempted with, turn this into bread and eat. That's the lust of the flesh. That's your body. Next. So first of all, well, he responds. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Glory to God. But by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Number, verse number five. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. What is he really trying to do? He's saying, if you're the son of God, prove it to me. Prove that you're the son of God. If you have to prove yourself, what is that? The pride of life. Last one. Jesus said, again it is written, you shall not put your Lord God to the test. And then the devil took him to a high, very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, be gone, Satan. For it is written that you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So Jesus overcame this. Look back at this last one. What was the temptation? It was look at all these I will give you, all the kingdoms of the world. He could see it. Everything you see will be yours. Trying to tempt him with the lust of the eyes. And Jesus overcame it. The reason that he, he, the Bible says that he was tempted in every way yet did not sin, he didn't go through every single temptation ever in the whole book, right? Like every single temptation known to man is probably like three billion, and Jesus was here for 30 years, right? So maybe he didn't go through every, but when it says he went through every temptation, it's because he went through and he succeeded in victory over the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what it comes down to. So if he did it, and the Bible says that no temptation is common to man, but in every one we've been provided a way of escape, then in the same way that Jesus overcame every category of temptation, we have the exact same 
tools that he used to fight back against the devil and overcome. What's that tool? It's the Word of God. The Word of God. It's what he used every time. It is written. It is written. It is written. All right. You guys still with me? Here's the good news. Here's the really good news. We just have the good news. Here's the really good news. Not only did he overcome the temptations that were presented him, but he overcame the world. Jesus said in John chapter 16, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Then the end of 1 John, it actually says, 1 John 5, it says, for everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that we have. Oh, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, sorry, our faith. So for everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. My question to you, some of you in the room, is have you been born of God? Many people in here, we love Jesus, we know God. If you do not genuinely know, before tonight's over, we'll give you an opportunity to know God. Because if you've been born of God, born again, Ian has gone, but Ian, Ian 2.0, as I like to say, is here with the Spirit of God living on the inside. You see, if that very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead when he overcame, if that self-same Spirit lives on the inside of me, and when you give your life to Jesus, it lives on the inside of you, then that very same overcoming power lives in you. It lives in you. It didn't just end with, take heart, I've overcome the world. That was in John. But then once the Holy Ghost showed up in Acts chapter 2, John writes this book after in 1 John, and he says, now anyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. So it's not just Jesus, but if the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of me, then I have that same spirit, then that means I overcome the world. Jesus just laid the groundwork when he died on the cross. He laid the groundwork for every Christian to walk in their God-given authority and assignment. That's what that is. It's, it's a foundation and a laying point. Look, I overcame the world. Now you do it as well. Now you follow me and you overcome the world. You guys still with me? You see, you don't have to conform to the world in order to be blessed, in order to be joyful, in order to feel free. You do not have to be conformed to the world. In fact, the Bible says, in fact, the Bible says, do not be conformed to the world. Do not, it's a command, do not be conformed to the world. And yet the temptation so many times is if you want to be happy, if you want to be blessed, if you want to do this, be conformed to the temptations or the image of the world. The problem is you don't have to do that. Why would, we, why would we conform to the image of the world when we're already on the winning side? You're partnering with the losing team or the one who's already lost, right? All right, for instance, say you go on a date with a, with a girl or, or you're, you're a girl, you go on a date with a guy, right? And you sit down and it's, it's date number one. You're stoked out of your mind. You sit down and they go, hey, look, I'm so excited to go out with you more. Like, I, I'm, I'll come out and get coffee with you. But just so you know, I am going to cheat on you. You wouldn't go on a second date. In fact, you probably wouldn't entertain them at all, right? You'd be a peace, I'm out. Then why so often do we partner with something that is so quickly passing away? What did verse 7 say? It said the world and all of its desires are passing away. The world's going to cheat on you and leave you behind. Because the moment you die, everything dies with it. But if you've chosen to not live for those things, but to live for something else, you chose not to partner with the world. You chose to live for something eternal. See what I'm saying today? You guys with me? You see, things in itself are morally neutral. There's nothing wrong with it. This is why it's diving in to the desires that come out of your heart. Things in and of itself are morally neutral. It's the unnatural desire or longing for them is when it becomes wrong. You guys with me? James 4, 3 sa says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. It does not say you ask and do not receive because you ask for the wrong thing. It says you do because you ask for it wrongly. What does it say after that? It says to spend it on your passions. Expose the heart of man. Expose the heart of man. It's not that we ask and, he, and, and we don't receive it because we ask for the wrong thing. It's because we ask with a heart motive that is in the wrong place. 
You see, God wants you, I believe God wants you to be blessed, but I would rather you be the poorest man on earth than let the desires of the flesh rob you from you, your eternal inheritance. You have an eternal inheritance waiting for you. So you can have all the things in this world, but miss out on everything that eternity has for you. You guys with me? Christianity cannot fall short of a life of total devotion. Christianity, I forget what I said. Whatever, yeah, Christianity cannot fall short of a life other than total devotion. My goodness, my goodness. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna end soon with this, but this is from James chapter four, verse four. I know I'm reading a lot. I got a lot of verses on here. James 4, verse 4 says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Enmity literally means to be in battle with, to be in contention or conflict. So to be friends or to, or to have friendship with the world not the people in the world, right? The things of the world. You have a, a, a friendship with the things in the world, then you've put yourself at conflict and made yourself an enemy of God. No matter what that looks like, if it's in a little way, like one of those things sneaking in from the pride of life, we've made ourselves a friend of the world. What this says is that many, um, many of you, right? Have, uh, m- m- not many of you, sorry. Not many of you. You guys are all awesome. Many people struggle in a a great many different ways. See how I rephrase that there? Many people struggle in a great many different ways in churches. How many of you heard, man, I'm just in this storm lately? Anyone ever heard, I'm just in this real big storm. The devil's just throwing all these kinds of things at me. And, uh, and of course, there is a a reality of of a storm, of the devil throwing things at you. But here's what I want to say, is that sometimes if we really examined our lives it would expose that maybe it's not the devil that's put us in that position, but it's being friends with the world has set us opposite of the will of God. So what it really takes is a moment of what we did before with Jonathan of asking for forgiveness. God, I don't want to be your enemy. I want to be your friend. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty easy. I want to be your friend, God. But the reality is, is that we, if we partner with things of the world, we've made ourselves an enemy with God. And so some of these storms we might be facing could be our own storm that we raised up because we said, I want to go my way. I want to have another God before him. Could be something little, could be something big. All right, what was the third one that we talked about? What was it again? Remember, the pride of life. You know, in the, in the book of James, it says that God opposes the proud. So I, I wanted to hit on that one more time because that was the one that I went, I, I, I went a lot on because that was the one that spoke to me a lot. The pride of life, it says God opposes the proud. He opposes them. So you are now in, if you are walking and partnering with pride, you are in opposition with God, the creator of the universe, the Lord of lords. That's pretty wild, right? I do not want to be in opposition with God. What does he say? But he gives grace to the humble. So maybe it's today realigning, saying, I don't want to be part of the pride of life. God, right now I repent from pride of life. I ask you now, would you humble me? Actually, that's a dangerous prayer. Don't ask him to humble you. Humble yourself. (laughs) That's what somebody told me once. I said, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to ask the Lord to humble me. I'm going to humble myself before he does because otherwise I'm going to go a lot lower. (laughs) So come up and just, whatever that looks like today is just say, man, God, I just, I humble myself and I say, I am not all that I say I am. And I need you. That's what we got to do. Does that make sense? So that's repenting from the pride of life and accepting that God gives grace to the humble. Man, I want grace. I want to be humble. Amen? Amen. It's just the reality that the last verse, right? 1 John 2, 17 says, And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. If our greatest love is our image, if our greatest love is money or promotion, if our greatest love is being seen or is it, our greatest love is dreaming about the future, yeah. then what we really need is a realignment with the heart of God. Yeah. Saying, I realize that I've partnered with the God of this world. I've partnered with loving the world, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of flesh. And God, tonight I need to realign myself with you. Yeah. Are you guys tracking with me tonight? 
Before we move on, I just want to give a quick moment of anyone in the room. If you do not know Jesus, I want you to meet him tonight. If you don't know Jesus, I want you to meet him tonight. We talk about him 24-7 because we love him. He's the best. He changed my life. When I was about 16 years old, I met Jesus for the very first time. I'd grown up in church my whole life. I was suicidal. I was depressed. I'd gone through a lot in the church. I pretty much just left it. Didn't want anything to do with God. Didn't want anything to do uh, with, with church or Christianity. Completely left. When I was 16, I went to one service, encountered the presence of God for the very first time, and my life was never the same. In one moment, completely set free from depression. Not one more negative day. I was six years ago, not one more negative day, not one day of depression, not one thing. Jesus changed my life in a moment. He wants to do the same for you. So in a moment, we're going to give everyone a chance to respond and make that decision to give up the desires of this world that are quickly passing away and realign our hearts with God. You guys with me? But right now, if you're in the room, you don't know Jesus, this is for you. Can everyone stand up across the room? See, you're created for a relationship with God. Every person in this room was created for that relationship, and sin stole it. It stole it. We talked about it today. It literally robbed us from the presence of God. If you were here last week, we talked about how to really ask for forgiveness. It's so simple, right? Didn't he make it so simple? Didn't Jonathan just make it? Wasn't that crazy? I was like, wow. Man, God is so good, and he loves you in this place. If you're here and you do not know Jesus, I plead with you, don't leave without making a decision to follow him. It will change your life forever. The world and all of its desires are passing away quickly and soon will be gone forever. Only the one who does the will of God will live forever with him. Tonight, would you make a decision to say, Jesus, I want to live for you? So a couple different people are, are, are maybe in this room. I wouldn't be a great preacher or a good evangelist if I didn't give the opportunity for you because I love you. So if you're here, if you don't know Jesus, tonight is the night you make a decision to follow after him once and for all. Maybe you don't even know why you're here today. You stumbled, in, stumbled into this Monday night. Maybe someone invited you, told them it was a free concert. You're like, yeah, showed up. It's all about Jesus. But if you're here and you, you've never experienced this, then tonight's for you. Perhaps you were like me, who, who grew up in church but never knew Jesus. I never had a relationship with God. I was so hurt, so broken, was depressed, so lost, and then I met Jesus. Maybe you realize you've grown up in church, but you do not know the person of Jesus. You realize you've never made a decision to give him your all, and tonight you want to do that and make yourself right with him. Or maybe one of those storms came upon you. Maybe it was self-induced. Maybe it's the work of the devil. It's reality, right? Maybe it was a sudden loss of a loved one, loss of a job, a close friend betrayed you. A storm arose and you were living for God and it was stripped from you, you fell away. You realize now you're not at that place with God, saying, Jesus, I want you back. He's looking at you, he's saying, son, daughter, come home tonight. Son, daughter, I love you, would you come home tonight? Or perhaps you're in this room and you just don't know. You just don't know if you're saved. You don't know if you've ever made a decision for Christ. Maybe you lie awake, at, in, uh, lie awake in bed at night just wondering, if I was to die or if I was not to wake up, would I meet Jesus? You pray again, Jesus, Jesus, would you just save me? And you have an anxiety about your salvation. Tonight, would you be sure of it? The Bible says we can have a confidence towards God. We can have a confidence towards God that when we stand before him face to face, He's going to look at you and say, well done, my good, my faithful servant. If you're here and you do not have relationship with God, you feel that in your heart and you want it, then right now is for you. Again, we couldn't leave. You say, why do you give so much time for this? Even if it was one person, I cannot leave this moment. So every head bowed, every eye closed. Again, if you're in this place, Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to give you new life. That all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you shall be saved. Not maybe, but you can know that you know that you know that if you were to leave this place, 
and not make it home, you'd stand before God and spend all of eternity with him. So again, if you're in this place, you do not know him, you fell away, some storm dragged you away from the presence of God, or you just realized that tonight you want to know that you know that you're saved. If that's you with every head bowed, would you just quickly lift your hand high enough for me to see? Quickly across this place, lift your hand high enough for me to see. There's hands going up. Circuit Riders, if you were in uh, Jesus People Tour, can you just do the drill? You know what to do. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Anyone else? Anyone else? There's hands all over the room. Circuit Riders, just kind of go, go say hi to them. Here's what I want you to do. Can everyone that raised your hand, can you look at me just for a moment? You just made the very best decision you could ever make in your whole life. Because no matter if that decision was to turn from a life of sin, or no matter if that decision was just to say, God, I don't know, but I wanna know. I wanna tell you that today's the day where your old self is gone and your new self is here. Today's a new day. Here's what I want you to do. Can you come out of your seat? Come right up to the very front. I wanna pray for you. This is not a moment to be afraid of. Come down to the front. Come down to the front. There's more back there. Keep coming. There's more down here. Keep coming right up. One more moment. One more moment. Keep coming to the front. Can you make some more room if there's more? Here we go. Perfect. Keep coming down to the front. If there's anybody else in this place and you want to give your life to Jesus, one more moment. One more moment. One more moment. Is another one. One more moment. Thank you, Jesus. You made the best decision ever. Hold on one second. One second, one second. If you're here, if you're still in the room and you didn't know if you were gonna make the call, you're like, I don't know, I didn't wanna be the only one. If that was you, but you still wanna be included, quickly just run up to the front while we pray. Just run up if that's you. If that's you, you were afraid you'd be the only one. There's no reason to, just run up to the front. Here's what I wanna do, we wanna pray one prayer. Then there's a couple circuit riders, just one person each. If there's like one circuit rider, you can just pull them up and just pray for them, just bless them real quick. But we're gonna pray really quickly, just one prayer together, make a declaration to God that I'm giving up all compromise, I'm leaving every, every bit behind, and I'm gonna follow after God. Does that sound good? The Bible says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, then we shall be saved. We can know that we know that we know we're going to heaven. So you guys ready for that? We're gonna pray this. Can everyone in the room shout this with me? We're gonna pray it as loud as we can. So can everyone shout this with me? Say it like you mean it. Say Jesus. Right now, I say I'm done with sin. I ask you to forgive me now. Make me new. In Jesus' name. Now this is the fun part. Say Jesus. I ask you to, oh no, not I ask you. Say Jesus. I receive your forgiveness for everything I've ever done. I am brand new, made clean, a new creation. And Jesus, I confess you as the Lord of my life. From this day to eternity, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, guys, there's just a couple, like one circuit rider with each person. Could you just go pray for them? Just bless them really quickly. I want the rest of you to stay engaged. So if you guys could just grab them, pull them off to the side or to the back, and, and just one circuit rider per person, go ahead and do that. I want the rest of the room to stay engaged. Can we focus for one more minute? Again, if you're in the front, if you're one of the people that responded or a circuit rider, can you just bring them off to the side or to the back? Then we can pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I feel the spirit of the Lord right now. I feel like he's about to do a great work in some of your hearts. I know he's already done a great work in mine this week. I know I'm ready for another touch tonight. So if you're here, I believe that God has something very special ready for you. 
Everyone lock in. One more minute is all I need. One more minute. One more minute. If you're here and you realize that you have been in partnership with the love of the world, and even in little ways you were exposed of having the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, or the lust of the flesh, if that was you in this place and you say, you know what, I need to get, we're not going to pray a prayer. You guys are already saved. I want you to come up and have a moment where you give all back to God and say, give me Jesus. You can keep the world. You can have all that. Give me Jesus. So if that's you and you're in this room and you say, I, I know, I partnered with the world. I'm done with it. I don't want to be an enemy of God. I don't want to be an enmity with him. I want real relationship. Come quickly to the front now. Come quickly to the front right now. Come quickly. Come quickly up to the front if that's you. Any circuit riders too, if you need to respond in just a moment with the Lord, just come anyway. We don't need everyone to minister. This is a moment they're going to have with the Lord. So everyone, if you need to respond, come up, fill in the corners. We're just going to worship for a moment. But simply pray a simple prayer of repentance and just ask him. Say, God, I don't want to partner with the love of the world. God, I want all that you have for me. And when you begin to do that, you begin to confess with your mouth. And you begin to say, God, I just want real relationship with you. I don't want this fake stuff. I don't want to be messed up within the world. I don't want to have pride in my life in any way then quickly come to the front and just spend some time praying. A couple people are going to come around and pray for you. God, I thank you for every person in this room. Right now, God, I ask you for your manifest presence to fall in this place. The manifest presence of the glory of God fall in this place. And God, I thank you that hearts are being made new today. That hearts are being made new today. Every heart I thank you that they'll leave with the victory found in Christ in Jesus' name. So again, if that's you, keep squeezing up to the front and just tell them with your voice. Can you even right now just begin to lift your voice? Tell them whatever it is you need to give up today. Lift up your voice. Tell them right now with your own voice. Come on, come on lift it up. Just tell them this is what I need to give up. This is what I'm leaving. I'm breaking up with the world. I'm giving it up. I'm giving it up. Just keep praying. We're going to go into worship in one minute. Just give them just a moment just to lift their own voices and get right with the Lord. Jesus, give me
decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. I have decided, come on, to follow Jesus. No turning, no turning back. No turning back. Come on, every voice singing. I have decided yeah. to follow Jesus. I have.
tonight that we saw our brothers and sisters get saved. I believe it's a prophetic act of what Jesus wants to do across the earth. Who here believes me? Who here believes that God wants to release revival in America? I said, who here believes that God wants to release revival through America? So what I wanna do just for a few moments, I know we have to wrap up soon. But just like our brothers and sisters who gave their life to Jesus tonight, can we cry out for America tonight? Can we cry out for souls to be saved? 
Can we cry out for revival to strike America again? We're gonna turn this into a prayer meeting just for a few moments. So if you can, every eye closed, every hand raised if you're comfortable. And I want you to pray like you've never prayed before because I feel like we are in a moment. We have to respond to heaven. We have to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us how to pray. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in America as it is in heaven. So on the count of three, I want us to lift our voice to heaven tonight. I want us to lift our prayer. Let revival strike America. On the count of three, are you guys ready? One, two, three. Just begin to ask, God release revival in our land. Release revival. We ask for souls. We ask for souls. We ask for souls in Jesus' name. We ask for families to come to know you. We ask for souls. Would you break out across America, God? Would you break out across our land? We humble ourselves. We humble ourselves. We are your people. 
can hear the Lord say tonight, I am looking to and through the earth, looking for those, looking for those. So if that's you, raise your hands tonight. Raise your hands tonight. Say, Lord, use me. Use me for revival. Use me for revival. You can use me. You can use me. I'm open. I am open. You can use me. Oh, I'm open. You can use me. I am open. I am open. Just tell the Lord. I am open. You can use me. I am open. You can use me. Today is the 
image in my mind and I don't know if you guys have ever seen a desert if you've ever seen a dry place where it's all the ground is all cracked up and it's all just it's just dry and dusty and at first whenever the water comes through and gets on it right it doesn't necessarily penetrate the soil you feel what I'm saying it kind of just glades over because it's been so hard and so compact over time it's been so dry and I just saw an image of like a hammer coming down on the ground and breaking up the ground so that whenever the rain came, it was actually able to be received. I believe that there's a shaking happening in our nation where the ground is being broken up because rain is coming. Y'all, y'all not hearing me in this place today. I said that the ground is being broken up because rain is coming. The revival we've been seeking for in Jesus' name. Oh, it is coming. The breakthrough that you have been contending for. It's coming. It's coming in the shaking that we've experienced. 
face the shaking that we've had to live through through COVID, through 2020, was all part of God's plan to break up the ground so that whenever the rain would come, it would actually be received. And so, I don't even know how to respond to that other than to say, Lord, do more of it. Seriously, just Lord, do more. Lord, do more. Guys, if you want more, if you want more, just lift up your voices with me and ask the Lord for more. Then, Lord, you would continue to break up the ground because we want to be able to receive the rain. We want to be able to receive the rain. Break up the ground, Lord. Break up the ground, Lord. We want to receive your rain. We want to receive your rain. We want to receive your rain. a lot of words for nights like tonight but this phrase kept ringing in my mind I was praying for a new friend down here and I felt the Holy Spirit to speak to me that she was in a season of, of preparation and, I, and I, I hope that you realize that nights like this are unusual right right it's, it's man it's, it's, it's something special is going on and a lot of times what happens is, again, I'm going to quote my dad. He's taught me everything. I love him so much. Is that a lot of times we miss what we're a part of. We were in revival. Like the Holy Spirit was here. People were getting saved. People were getting healed. People were getting delivered and free. Right? It takes us to be not in the environment to go, oh, well, that was something special. That was something special. See, what the Lord, though, is doing, what I felt tonight is, the presence of God, the glory of God is in this place to prepare you. This is not about a flash in the pan, great worship night, great talk, perfect sound. Oh, no, it's not about any of that. What it's about is that there's a call and a destiny on each one of your lives. And I hope that you don't just come and go, I was encouraged. I hope that you've figured out by now how seriously God takes you and your future and who you're becoming and where he's taking you, that he's preparing you, that his presence is so near because you're going to have to lead people to that place, that you're seeing salvation because you're supposed to lead people to Jesus. That you're hearing being called into no compromise because that's supposed to be the message and the lifestyle of your very life. So every head, every head bowed real quick. Every eyes closed. I'm going to pray us out tonight. Holy Spirit, you're preparing each one of us. Each one of us. God, I pray that maybe for the first time tonight that they would have a moment. A moment of self-reflection and realize that maybe they put a ceiling on their life of who they could become, of how they could be used by you. That they've been a participant because that's all they believe they could really be. I'm just here to watch because that's my job. It's not your job. You're not just called to be a part. You're not just called to be a follower. You're not just called to come here and watch and see and enjoy. You're not just called here to experience the Holy Spirit. You're not just called here to sing with us or to learn from the scriptures. You are called to be a missionary. 
You are called to be a voice. You are called to be a messenger on, for this generation. And so, Holy Spirit, tonight, I pray every ceiling would be broken off every man and woman in this place. I pray every dampener, every muting button on our voice would be broken off. I pray every voice in our head that says what we have to say is worthless would be ripped out. I pray every little second guessing, every hesitancy about our future and making those decisions that we know you are calling us into would be silenced and that we would make the leap. So Holy Spirit, I pray that today, tonight, that this week would be a week of courage, of courage to dare to believe that there is more to our life than we realize right now. I pray this week we would give you all worry about our future, how we're going to get there, how it's all going to work, and that we would realize that, that we are in the center of your training, the center of your preparation. We are right where we're supposed to be, that you have us in the palm of your hand, and that you are leading us to live a life that has more impact than we maybe have ever considered before. So Holy Spirit, empower us. We pray for salvation this week. We pray for divine appointments this week. We pray that people would experience healing in their body. We pray that people would be set free in their hearts. We pray for depression to melt away, anxiety to be melted away, that suicide and death over our generation would be broken off. We pray for the very revival that we are praying for, that you would anoint us to walk it out. Give us the push. Push us beyond our fear. God, help set us up to teach us, to show us how to live like disciples. We pray we would see our lives like this stage, a platform. God, teach us about the platform that you've given each one of us. Show us it. Give us revelation. We need it. So pray us to me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. I'm ready to be used by you. I break every dampening thing off of my voice, off of my life, and off of my dreams. I'm right on time. I'm right where I need to be. I am in a season of preparation. And I'm just getting started. So, Lord, we give you glory today. We just admit that the future is way better than we're thinking. <laughs> Our worry has always led us to the wrong conclusion. <laughs> that inner voice has always been wrong in the end. So we just pray for a week that we'd have the courage to, to believe what you're telling us. And to believe that you can do more through us than we think we can do ourselves. And so we love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Hear it from me as circuit, part of the Circuit Rider leadership. If you are not a part of our community, we are so happy you're here. We are so happy you're here. If you're a DTS student, we're so happy you're here. If you are part of our staff, we're so happy we get to be together on these nights. After two years of watching a YouTube screen, it is so special to be together. We'll see you next Monday at 6 p.m. We love you. Have an incredible night. Greenhouse tomorrow. Greenhouse Wednesday. Greenhouse Thursday. One more thing. We have to be out of here in the next 10 minutes. So grab your things. Feel free to talk as long as you want outside. Grab your stuff.